This is the Sean Kelly on Movies podcast for Tuesday, August 10th, 2021, featuring an interview with Amelia Moses on Bleed With Me. Hello, and welcome to the Sean Kelly on Movies podcast. Today I have an interview with Amelia Moses, whose film Bleed With Me is now available on VOD in Canada and is also available for streaming on Shutter. This release is well-timed since it was one year ago this month that Believe With Me had its premiere as part of the Fantasia Film Festival, and it also played on Super Channel last fall as part of the Blood in the Snow Film Festival, which is when I conducted this interview. I hope you enjoy. So um, how did the idea for Believe With Me come about? Believe With Me was a concept I came up with like a couple of years ago now, um, and the initial premise that I kind of wanted to explore was um, like a couple and a single person in an isolated location and kind of looking at those dynamics. Um, and I really want to tell a story from a single perspective and a kind of um, unreliable narrator because the film obviously kind of deals with themes of like the way we kind of put narratives on other people. And usually in our real life, it's kind of we idealize people or kind of assume they have things better off than us. But in this version, she, she kind of um, concocts a more twisted narrative about her friend. Um, so I definitely wanted to keep it through Rowan's perspective and let everything kind of follow from, from there. So, um, from the very start, Rowan is a bit of a third wheel on this cabin trip. So, um, why would you think that she was invited in the first place? I think it has to do with, um, the way Emily sees her and the more we understand about Emily's character, um, regardless of whether Emily is, you know, um, doing the things Rowan thinks she is, because I, I feel like the film's very up for interpretation, and I don't know if there's one set answer, but at the core of her character, she is like a caretaker, and she needs people to need her. So I think naturally she's drawn to more introverted people, um, you know, more insecure people, and I think she sees that as um, she's helping them, but I think obviously that is a, a weird kind of... Um, power dynamic or um, she sees herself as, you know, better, better than as well a little bit too. So I think sometimes people, a lot of times I think you see that in real life too, someone who's maybe more outgoing um, and extroverted might be very close friends with someone who's more like introverted. So I think that that um, happens sometimes as well in dynamics, friendship dynamics. So um, would you describe Rowan's experience throughout the film as being some form of gaslighting? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think, um, yeah, I think that, I think what's kind of also at the core of, of Emily's character that I kind of wanted to explore was this, um, disorder called Munchausen by proxy, which I'm sure you've heard of before, where like you, um, make someone sick in order for you to take care of them, or you harm someone in order that you are forced to take care of them. And that kind of gives you this, um, feeling of power, um, and that you are needed. Um, and I think inevitably that, um, definitely has an element of gaslighting in it because you're trying to convince someone that they're sick or crazy or, you know, that, that, that they're wrong in some way. So I think there's definitely an element of, of Emily. Um, there's definitely an element of gaslighting in Emily's character, for sure. So much of the film is about the dynamic between um, Rowan and Emily. But then there is also Emily's boyfriend, Brendan, who's kind of like a bystander to everything that's going on. So what would you say is his mindset throughout the film? Yeah, I mean, I think Brendan also kind of remains um, ambiguous as well. Like I think that in the earlier on in the film, you're not sure kind of how involved he is, mm -hmm. but I think very much he's not involved. And that was um, the intention to kind of let him be more of um, like, he almost becomes the third wheel, <laughs> like as the film goes on. Mm -hmm. um, and he's there kind of as a foil for the two women because I think, especially at the beginning, sometimes the two women are kind of um, talking to each other through him. Um, I think it's interesting sometimes we, when we only know a friend through um, their partner, or only know their partner kind of through your friend, like Emily's the kind of the core person between these, these three people, right? And I think she enjoys the fact that she is in that power position in this kind of triangle. And so I think Brendan's presence is important because he kind of shifts those dynamics sometimes not because who he is but just by the very nature of him being there the very nature of him existing um but he's kind of supposed to remain more of a neutral 
person um, who can kind of push back against Emily at times. So talk a bit about the ambiguity of the film. So um, how do you expect um, audiences to like interpret what's going on? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the core of the film for me is, is um, portraying this kind of codependent relationship um, and also Rowan's kind of journey from desperately wanting something so she wants friendship. She wants this confirmation of of, um, of friendship from Emily um, and feeling secure in that. And then by the end of the film, spoilers, um, she doesn't uh, she doesn't get what she wants. And I think that's kind of interesting when characters like sabotage themselves a little bit, um, because, again, regardless of whether Emily's really doing something, um, Rowan doesn't get what she she wants or needed at the beginning of the film. And I think that's kind of interesting. Um, and there was, an, there was an opportunity where like it almost could work, you know, both women kind of need each other and are kind of obsessed with each other for different reasons, but their friendship kind of works in a super fucked up way um, because they do both um, complement each other. Um, but ultimately Rowan doesn't succeed in, in that uh, friendship and that relationship. Um, I think kind of the ambiguity lies with more like the extent of what Emily is doing to her. So I think that you could read it as like, it's really happening and she's trying to consume her blood or take her blood for whatever reason <clears throat> as some way to weaken her um, and get her to stay, you know, that codependency thing as well. Um, or you can read it somewhere in the middle, like um, there is an element of gaslighting and Munchausen by proxy and she is making her sick um, because that's much more of a grounded thing. But then Rowan is taking it to this kind of, vampiric level of like Emily is this like monster figure um, or nothing is happening at all. I feel like inevitably what the film um, suggests is that there's like, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, but I think films are interesting in the way that they can be open for interpretation. Um, you know, I obviously it's dealing with um, vampiric imagery, but I never wanted to call it a vampire movie because there are no vampires. I didn't want there to be some expectation that there was going to be vampires, but it's obviously drawing from that. But a lot of people I've talked to about the film have just straight up being like, she's a vampire, no doubt. So it's interesting. I really love that part of it where people can um, put their own interpretation on it. Well, definitely, um, this is moving into spoilers, but what I think the biggest head scratcher in the film is when Rowan finds the um, scalpel and vial in the floorboards and like, you're wondering is, did Emily put it there or did like Rowan in some sort of fugue state put it there? And <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I think that um, whether it's, it's noticed by the audience or not, there was a conscientious effort in the script to um, establish things in the first half of the film so there is a discussion about um, things behind hidden walls. Um, Emily tells a story to them early on in the film and it's supposed to be just kind of one of those like spooky kind of urban legends. Like, oh, I heard this story, you know, um, about someone living behind a wall. Oh yeah, I remember So that yeah, so like that could potentially be something that then enters um, Rowan's head, right? As in terms of like something that could be getting under her skin and into her brain. Um, on top of that, like it's it's a very old house that I would imagine would have, might have weird stuff. Obviously that's next level weird to find this box. Um, but again, I think um, you could totally see it, see it different ways. I think that um, to some extent, the film is sort of about narratives and storytelling because she's creating a narrative that we don't know is true or not. Um, and we hear lots of stories being told in the film, like like I just said, when em the first night they're there, Emily tells that story about, you know, she knows so and so who knows so and so who had this experience where they someone was living in their apartment and they didn't know. Um, and then there's the whole story about the stalker and stuff. And so um, Rowan's very much kind of consuming these narratives, and they're getting into her brain, but also she's. Um, expressing these narratives too that have maybe not full art fully true or have um you know she's potentially lying or she is lying about stuff as well so um for a film with only three characters the casting was definitely important so um how did you um cast the characters 
Yeah, so I had done um, a short film with uh, Lee Marshall, who plays Rowan. Um, we'd done a short film called Undress Me together in 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. And um, I met her in the casting room for that. And it was just one of those things is like, as soon as I saw her, um, her audition, I knew she was great for the part. She was just like really a standout actress. And then we really bonded on set. And I think she was just really willing to kind of commit to that role. That was a body horror film. So there was um, a lot of um, blood and kind of um, special effects, practical effects and stuff. And she had to really, you know, throw herself into it. So I think the fact that she did all those things on that shoot really made me feel confident that she could bring a lot to the table in terms of Rowan. So I actually wrote Lead With Me and Rowan's character with Lee in mind. Um, I think she's very good at showing this kind of rawness and vulnerability. And it's a film that's all on her face pretty much. So it was definitely a lot for her to carry. And then um, Lauren Beatty, I had met um, working on a mutual friend's short film um, a couple years back. And we were trying to shoot a scene from the film just for a grant application. And I asked her to act in it. And just because I knew she was an actor, um, and she just really inhabited the role well. And she has a very, you know, intense face. And she really kind of embodied Emily very early on. This was before I even wrote the script. So again, I had her in my mind too in writing the script. And then when we got the funding, they were both on board to be in the film, which was great. And so the last person was, was Brendan. So we did a more kind of traditional casting call for Brendan um, and landed on Ari Tyros, who did a really amazing job. Um, and my main worry was kind of like the three of them all getting together or like all like um, getting along, I guess, because we were in this cabin for a long time. It's just the three of them. Like I didn't want, I wanted them to all be able to like trust and support each other. And they all really had great chemistry from very early on. And we spent a lot of time just kind of um, hanging out in advance to kind of prepare for that. Well, uh, kind of like I think I remember from the it's Q and A where was talking about limping up a hill. Yeah, so um, Lauren unfortunately got into a motorcycle accident on a trip and we were shooting in January and she uh, called me in November and she's like, I'm in a hospital in Mexico and I, I can't walk currently. Um, so it was a bit frightening knowing we were going into production with her and so I just said, keep me posted and let me know how things go. And so we kind of kept talking because I really, really wanted her for the role and I didn't really want to have to find someone new and I just knew she was the right fit. Um, and then she had recovered a fair bit, but then when we got onto set, her limp was much more prominent than I imagined it would be to, to the extent that if we kind of didn't acknowledge it in the film, um, I don't know, I wasn't sure how to proceed. So we shot a few scenes um, and I was still deciding what to do with it. Um, and then I think the produce, one of the producers, um, Marielle had, had mentioned something about how um, if this character had a limp her whole life, she would walk quite differently than someone like Lauren who had a very recent injury. You know, you carry your body qu quite differently than if you, um, had experiences your whole life versus like, you know, a more recent injury. So I felt like we needed to kind of acknowledge it and then kind of weaved it into the film, um, with the idea that it's weakened Emily in a sense that if she's someone who very much likes to have control and doesn't, she likes to care for other people all of a sudden now Brendan is caring for her and she doesn't like that shift in dynamic. Again, this is not as concretely in the film, it's more like in the backstory. Um, so that was kind of how I approached the integration of it. But yeah, on a practical level, the cabin was on top of this hill and um, usually it wouldn't be too bad to walk up, but it was like end of winter. So it was like snow and ice all piled up and very early on we knew Lauren would not be able to walk up it. And so we had a system with a winch and a sled to get all the um, gear up there. So we're like, well, why don't we put Lauren in the sled? <laughs> so we'd put blankets down and we'd, we'd bring her up the hill every day. Um, so that was kind of a weird experience for her as well. All right, that'll be it. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. There's some good questions in there. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The Sean Kelly on Movies podcast is hosted and researched by Sean Patrick Kelly and is a production of SKOnMovies.com. Hosting, music, and transitions courtesy of Anchor.fm. Episodes and show notes can be found at SKOnMoviesPodcast.ca and you can subscribe to us via Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and where else podcasts are hosted. 
Support us by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash skonmovies. This has been the Sean Kelly on Movies podcast for August 10th, 2021, and I'll see you next time.